I guess uh, you, perhaps like my wife and I, are kind of uh, staying more at home these days, hunkered down in our bunkers, as it were, and waiting for the storm to pass. Interesting times, challenging times. And in the midst of this, I just thought I would send out a message of hope and encouragement, direction from Scripture. It's a message that I've taught on from time to time over the past year in particular, and written on in the praise letter as well, but it seemed even more timely and appropriate uh, in our present situation. So uh, just quickly, I want us to, to look into the letter to the church at Philippi from Paul. While you're doing that, if you have your Bibles, if you'd like to, let me remind you that in the coming months and in years, hopefully, we will be doing more of this online teaching, music, podcasts. We've got some interesting and I think exciting things in store uh, in the future. So keep visiting us on our Facebook page. I'm kind of that old dog learning new tricks thing uh, with how this all works, but we are learning and I think it's very exciting the opportunities we have to minister in this uh, in this way in the upcoming months and years as the Lord tarries. If you want to look in the uh, fourth chapter of Philippians, we're going to look at the sixth and seventh verses in particular. The church at Philippi is uh, a little bit fractured. There's a, there's a kind of a stress fracture in the middle. On one hand, you've got some that are holding on to legalism, the form of the law, the rules and the regulations. On the other hand, you've got those who are what's called antinomianists is a big word. I didn't know what it meant either until I looked it up. But those who believe there should be no cultural, social, moral law guidelines whatsoever. And we see once again, as scripture says, there's really nothing new under the sun. This is the present day situation and crisis oftentimes in our own churches is that there are still those who hold on to more a legalistic form and then those who just, you know, anything goes and everything goes because, quote, we're under grace. I think it was Pastor Jeffress at First Baptist in uh, Dallas a few years back wrote a book entitled Grace Gone Wild, and he makes an excellent point that the pendulum always seems to swing, and in recent years it has seemed to uh, gone over to the side of under the heading of grace that we should not have uh, really many concerns at all about behavioral issues, uh, under the heading of grace, anything goes, everything goes, and that certainly is, is not what Scripture teaches. But this is the reality of the Philippian church, that there's this kind of uh, fracturing process. Paul actually addresses uh, two ladies in particular by name, Euodia and Syntyche, who we don't know. The text doesn't tell us what the uh, tension or the stress was between them. It's very possible, because of what we know about the church, that perhaps one of them was leaning more towards this legalistic side and the other one not so much. We don't know. Again, the text doesn't tell us, but we know that he's writing in the midst uh, to give direction to a rather stressful situation. And after he addresses these two ladies and their situation, then he kind of takes a breath almost and is like, but you know what? Rejoice. Rejoice always in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice, kind of like a little pause, a little breath here before we go forward into the next portion of the text. And the, and the part I want to look at especially is starting in the sixth verse, where Paul writes, be not anxious. Now, some translations say, uh, be anxious about nothing. Uh, probably the more concise, direct translation would simply be, be not anxious or have no anxious thoughts. <clears throat> this first struck me, I think it was a little over a year ago, my wife and I were in our Sunday school class at church, and we usually have prayer requests at the beginning of our class time. And I would say on average, there's five or six requests that are offered. And this particular Sunday, they just one person had a request. And I, I thought, well, that was kind of strange because that was certainly below the average. But I also thought it was strange because uh, three rows behind me and to my right sat Wes and Susan, who had just recently lost their lovely 19-year-old daughter, Emily, in a tragic car wreck. Sitting directly behind me were Sam and Pat and Sam was recently diagnosed with Parkinson's and is beginning to present some significant challenges into their lives because of that. Way over to our left sat Linda. We actually have four Lindas in our class. It gets very confusing. Uh, her husband had been in a, a nasty motorcycle accident. is in a lot of pain a lot of the time, and he rarely can sit through the teaching hour of Sunday school because he just he, he's so uncomfortable, and he was not present at that time. And and directly behind us sat another Linda who had just that week lost her husband. 
uh, gentleman that I'd played golf with many times, wonderful guy. And then sitting next to me is my own wife, Linda, one of the other Lindas, who, as many of you know, has battled uh, cancer for 33 years now. Surgeries, radiation, chemo, more surgeries, more radiation. Presently on another, a number, uh, another a round of chemo. And uh, three years ago, she had a craniotomy, and that's left her left side kind of compromised, and she's a little off balance and shaky, and she's doing well, all things considered. We live in the new normal, as they say, but God's grace has certainly been sufficient. But it was in that environment that I just thought, boy, just within our Sunday school class of, uh, you know, about 40 people, there are tremendous needs. And I extrapolated that out to our uh, church body and could think of many more just uh, tremendous needs, things that people are going through. Then I extrapolated that out to the body of Christ in general. I think of the the deep and difficult times, and, and many of you, as I even talk to you right now, are going through very, very deep waters, difficult situations, and then with this present pandemic seems to pile on an extra layer of uh, concern, if not stress and anxiety. So in the midst of all of this, what would the Lord say to us? Well, we always go to his word, and that's where we are in the fourth chapter, the sixth verse. And here's what the Lord says. In the midst of all this, of all of our personal situations in a worldwide pandemic, the Lord says, don't be anxious. Now that seems really counterintuitive. It's almost kind of like, oh sure, easy for you to say. But this isn't a, a, a light suggestion. It, it's a command. Don't be anxious. And it goes on. But in everything, now let's look at our circumstances. Does that apply to us? Very nature of the word. Of course it does. Everything. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make all of your requests known to him. Now let's look at that for a moment. Prayer. I love what Oswald Chambers says about prayer. Prayer is not so much about getting something from God as it is just getting God. I wish that we could all learn that, myself included, because I, like probably many of you, often come into my prayer time sort of in a rush, kind of got my grocery list of wants and needs and requests, and Lord, would you please do this, and heal Linda, and touch my body, and watch over our kids, and da 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 and, and then we, we leave. I want to encourage you, um, and this may seem strange, but in your prayer time, don't talk. Just don't talk. He knows what we have need of, even before we ask. Now, I'm not saying don't articulate anything, but at least, at least commit some of your prayer time to just spending time in his presence, listening, waiting, even if you don't sense or hear anything. I'm not saying that if you suddenly be silent and open your ears up, you're going to hear a voice. I'm just saying we need to learn to spend time in the presence of the Lord with comfort in silence without always kind of filling up all the space with our own words and thoughts. Uh, kind of a, a way to sort of present this, I guess. I, I, I remember when my children were real little, our daughter Jennifer came first, and I thought, oh, this is going to be so great, a little girl. I'll hug her and kiss her and hold her in my lap. And, and I did all those things, but Jennifer's always been full of activity. Not not in a hyper sense. She's just a, she's a mover. If she's not sleeping, she's moving somewhere <laughs> doing something. She just, uh, she's full of energy and teaches, you know, boot camp and, and athletic type things and Bible studies and uh, four children to look after and a husband. And I mean, her, her plate is full. And even when she was little, I'd hold her on my lap. She'd sit there a while, but pretty soon she'd stiffen out like little kids do slide off and she was off doing something. Then when Jeffrey, our son, came along about nine years later, I thought, well, I don't know, little boys probably don't respond the same, want to be held and kissed. And all. Oh, Jeffrey would just sit in my lap. He'd fall asleep, you know, just sitting in my lap. Now, do you think I ever minded that? Do you ever think I ever thought, oh, he fell asleep. This is no fun. He's not, he's not enjoying this time together. No, those are some of the most precious times when he just sat there and I could just hold him. It's true of our Heavenly Father. Uh, just learn to relax in his presence, to spend time. Don't talk. Silence. He knows your needs. He knows your quest. I mean, obviously, make all of your needs known. He, he invites us to do that, even with a sense of boldness. Come into my presence. Make all of your petitions known. But I think the other side of that is, but also be still. Just be still and enjoy the, the, the peace and the presence of the Lord. Then with supplication, it goes on to say, supplication 
denotes both an intercessory component and also humility. Intercessory prayer, as uh, again, Chambers uh, defines at one point, I love this, is not so much about getting an idea of what the need is so that we can make some judgment about it. Ours is never to make a judgment. Intercessory prayer is to be so engaged, partnering in prayer that we, in a sense, access the mind of God toward the situation. We join in that. We parallel in that prayer to intercede on behalf of something or someone. And then supplication also denotes humility. And uh, I think that's an important point because there's a lot of arrogance in the body of Christ. Today. A lot of people, these little formulas of, you know, say these promises over and over, or just claim the promises, remind the Lord of what he said as though he may have forgotten. Now, last time I checked, we don't tell him what to do and how he needs to do it. Uh, we listen for his still small voice. We study his word and he speaks to us and tells us what we need to do. So humility. And then with thanksgiving. Now that seems maybe, boy, in the tough, difficult situations of life, it's maybe harder to be thankful. But I guarantee you that in our times of greatest distress, we are always more blessed than we are distressed. And to illustrate that, if you will, you know, in your spare time, take out a sheet of paper, draw a line down the middle on one side, list all of your uh, stresses and strains and predicaments and trials, on the other side, list all of the blessings of the Lord. And I absolutely guarantee you, the side with the blessings will always far outweigh the, the side with the, the challenges and the stresses. We are always more blessed than we are distressed. Every beat of our heart is a gift. Every dr breath we draw is a gift from the Lord. We are abundantly blessed. His mercies are new every single morning. Mercies, plural, every single day of our lives. We are so blessed. So make all of your petitions known to the Lord, all of your requests known. And, and I'm not proposing a formula here, but, but it, is, it is a plan of God, if you will. He's giving us guidance. This is how you come to me. This is how you gain what I want to give you. Well, what, what is it that he really wants to give us? What is it that we should gain from this? We say, well, I, I, the answer is to my prayers. That's what I'm after. I'm, I'm in deep waters. I'm in stre stressful times. Okay, one, I'll pray. Two, supplication. Three, with thanksgiving and kind of like the genie, now the answer uh, will appear. Well, in my study Bible, as I read that portion of Scripture, verse uh, 6 and 7, I actually have to turn the page to get to the next part, which is, in a sense, the payoff, if you will. And it says, And the peace of God, which surpasses your very comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. This peace is not a feeling. It's not an emotion. And this is important for us to grasp. This peace is actually a bulwark or a fortress. We need to think of it that way, almost in military terms. You say, well, how, why? How do you know that? Because it says it will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You don't need a guard unless there's an assault. The peace he wants to give is a fortress. It is a surrounding. It is a bulwark. It is a protective wall, if you will. It's more than just a, a feeling and an emotion. A lot of people, oh, if I could just feel this way, feel that. That may be part of it. Once you know what he has provided, once you begin to live in that, I think there is an accompanying feeling of peace, but we're not after the feeling. We're after the security. I, I often say, according to scripture, this is according to scripture, that we know that he goes before us, right? We know that he is our rear guard. We know according to scripture, he is beside us to the left and the right. According to scripture, we know that he undergirds us. And according to scripture, he sings over us. I always like to say he's got you covered on all sides, all around. This peace is a fortress. It is a bulwark. It is a protection. So don't be anxious. But in everything, your present situation included, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, Make all of your requests known to him. And the peace of God that surpasses your very comprehension will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That's his promise. And I pray that you receive that promise today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Here we look at one brief little passage, but it speaks volumes to our lives. I pray for all who might be watching this that they will access your peace Perhaps a feeling and emotion will accompany that. But more than that, Lord, that we will understand that you provide for us 
a bulwark, a fortress, a wall of protection to guard us in these stressful times. I pray that for each and every one in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you.